according to the cloud. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the monthly OTSC meeting. Uh, we've got a special guest today and uh, BHS, if you wouldn't mind doing introductions, let's kick it off. Sure, yeah, uh, so Loic and I have been communicating over email for the last couple of weeks or so. Um, he reached out to ask the questions around combining uh, distributed traces, a la open tracing, and dapper, Zipkin, that sort of thing, with kernel tracing information. And uh, we met up in uh, Copenhagen at the KubeCon thing a couple of, uh, I guess, last week, and had a bunch of great conversations there. So I invited him to present here. Uh, so I think the work he's doing is really interesting. And it's uh, combining different disciplines of tracing, which is always like fun. So uh, yeah, I mean, Aloic is a master's student at uh, Polytechnique Montreal and knows a lot about uh, the kernel side of things and also the distributed tracing side of things. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear the, the talk. And, uh, and I should mention he has a hard stop at the hour. So, um, you know, we should we'll have to be disciplined about asking our questions quickly and so on. But take it away, Aloic. Thank you. Yep. Well, uh, thanks, Ben, uh, for the introduction. I think you, you said it all. Um, so today I'm going to, uh, to discuss how we can combine different kinds of tracing. I think uh, now is the time for uh, having kind of hybrid approaches if we want to understand the performance and the behavior of our systems better. So uh, I'm going to have a special focus on kernel tracing today um, because I'm assuming, of course, that you know better than me what open tracing is, what it can do, what are its advantages in terms of uh, uh, understanding what your uh, uh, distributed system is doing using traces. I hope you don't mind if I discuss a few of its limitations um, because that's actually the, the the subject of the talk and I'm also going to assume that you don't know a lot about kernel tracing so I'm going to start with a short introduction about what it really is. Okay so you can you can think of it as the parallel word of tracing because um, if I'm telling you that I'm doing tracing, probably all of you are going to consider that I'm doing something that is related to open tracing, but it's actually a bit different. So kernel tracing is actually an efficient uh, solution if you want to analyze how your systems behave. Um, it's not entirely new, okay? Uh, we have different traces uh, for Linux available, so probably some of you are familiar with uh, Ftrace or even EDPF or System Tap. Um, in my lab, we're focusing on developing LTTNG, which is um, probably the most efficient in, in terms of kernel tracing. And the main focus of kernel tracing are the high precisions of the events. Um, this is actually one of the first things that you can uh, see in comparison with open tracing. Open tracing focuses much more on the causality between the events rather than the precision of the timestamps. But as for kernel tracing goes, we want to infer um, the causality of the events afterwards, okay, during analysis time, which is why we, we need that high precision for the timestamps. Um, there's also um, a big focus on the overhead, okay. We don't want to, uh, to have a big overhead when we collect all these events from the kernel. So um, the very reason why we don't want to do that is because if we want to reproduce some tricky bugs, um, then we don't want to to have the system um, behaving differently because we're tracing. This is called the observer problem in, in physics, but it's actually the same um, kind of things in computer science here. And there's also a focus on the fact that we can do offline analysis using the trace that we just collected, okay? So if I'm taking you through the common workflow of, com of, um, of kernel tracing, the first thing that people are going to do is that they, they insert static trace point uh, into the kernel. Okay, so that's being done. We have a, a lot of trace points already available. We can also do that in user space applications, but my focus today is on uh, kernel tracing. Uh, then we, we choose uh, what trace points we want to activate at runtime. So we use our uh, preferred tracer to say, I'm going to collect all the uh, sketch switches, uh, all the, the system calls, uh, entry and exits, or the interruptions. Okay. Uh, and then the traces collect the event. So each time um, your kernel hits one of the trace points that are selected, uh, it's going to emit an event. And these events are written either into a file or then they can be sent over the network too. 
And then these trace files can be analyzed by specialized analysis tools. So uh, Trace Compass is one of them. And these tools actually take these events and create nice views so that you can understand what goes on in your system. Um, okay, so that was for uh, the facts. Now, I'd, I'd like to analyze what, what I call a tricky bug with you so that you can see what uh, kernel tracing can do uh, in terms of debugging, debugging applications or understanding what goes on uh, in your systems. So here's the situation. Okay, so I, I'm going to demonstrate all that in a moment, but I'm, I prefer to explain it first. Um, we have uh, three processes. Okay, two of them are running on the same CPU, uh, low prior one and high prior one. Okay, so you can see the priorities on the left, by the way. Uh, we have a, a third process that is scheduled on uh, CPU zero, high prior zero. Uh, there is a shared resource that both low prior one and high prior zero uh, want to lock. And you have the control flow on the left. So low prior one starts first, okay, then high prior one starts which means that low prior one gets preempted because it has lower priority. Uh, and then high prior one, uh, high prior zero gets scheduled in. And at this moment, it requests l the lock. Okay, and the question is, what happens next? Okay, uh, is high prior zero able to uh, take the resource that is currently held by low prior one? Second situation is roughly the same, okay? But in this case, high pro zero has a lower priority than high pro one. Okay, so uh, we want to know what happens next. And if, if, we, if we want to understand that, um, we can think that what's going to happen is that high pro one can get the shared resource back, okay? Because it has higher priority than low prior one, which currently holds the resource, okay? so. Uh, logically, it should be able to get the resource back. So let's find out. Okay, there's no, nothing, um, nothing uh, more important than practice. So we have this little example that's been uh, coded. So trust me, it works just like I, I told you, but if you don't trust me, I can uh, obviously publish the, the code for that. So. Uh, I, I hope all of you can see the, um, the terminal. You can increase if you want. If someone can't see, you can just uh, shout. I try to adjust. Okay, no shouting. So it's been uh, freshly rebuilt. Um, then I've got a bunch of lines here to um, initiate the tracing session, which means basically, like I told you, I need to activate the events that are going to be interesting for the analysis. So basically, I'm taking all the kernel events. Uh, and then what I did is that I started tracing, I executed my little program, and, and I stopped the tracing right after that. Okay, so you can see all that uh, happening. And if I change directory to the parent one, I can see that here I have a directory that is called sket trace, and that actually uh, hosts the, the file that were written by the, the tracer. And if I want to be convinced, uh, I can use something called Babel Trace that, that just dumps all the events okay, to terminal. So this is what a kernel trace looks like. I know it's not, you know, it's not appealing. We have our timestamps on the left, uh, the name of the event here, and here a bunch of, um, of pairs, key value, which you could relate to open tracing tags actually. Okay, so I know for example that each of the events uh, happen on a specific CPU, and I, I have the identifier of that, that CPU. Okay, um, so what I did, if I if I show you the code, so my main function, what it does, uh, almost everything is commented except except for these two runs. So the first thing that I ran was the first example that I showed you. Okay, the one where the the process high prio zero has higher priority than the other processes, all of the other processes. And then the other case where high prio zero has higher priority than low prior one, but a lower priority than high prior one. Okay, so this has been run. Um, but if I want to understand what goes on, I'm not going to use bubble trace, okay, because uh, 
it's just a dump of the events, what I'm going to use is a trace analyzer. So here is trace compass. Uh, I already loaded the trace into it, run the analysis, it just takes a few seconds. You can see that here I have what is called the control flow view. It looks very much to what you can find in uh, um, open tracing traces, you know, with spans being just uh, the states of the different processes that, that you have in the tree on the left side, okay? And here, um, what I'm highlighting here is the first execution that I showed you, okay? So back to the slides, it corresponds to that execution, that first situation where I have high prior zero with higher priority than the two other processes, okay? And then this is my second run, which is the other situation where high prior zero has an average priority between the two other processes. And the colors here uh, can tell you that when it's green, uh, the process is running in user space. So it's actually executing code. When it's yellow, it means that it's waiting for something to happen. So it's blocked uh, either for a mutex to be released or for a IO to be available or something. When it's orange, it's waiting for CPU. So it's not surprising that you have uh, two processes here fighting for CPU because uh, we forced them to be scheduled on the same core, okay? Um, and if we zoom in, we can understand even more what happens um, at this critical moment. This is where things get really interesting. Okay, so here, as I said, we have low prior uh, one executing first, and then high prior one starts. And when it starts, obviously it preempts the process. So I have to go back a bit. This is, this is why high prior one executes first. Okay, so it preempts the process low prior one. But then high prior zero comes in and it requests the shared resource using that system called open ads. Okay. And then high prior zero has to wait for the resource to be released. Okay, so it's, it's in a state where it's blocking for a certain shared resource to be released. And what goes next is a bit surprising. High prior one gets preempted by low prior one, even though high prior one has a higher priority than uh, low prior one. And the reason is because um, High prior zero requests the shared resource. So it means that temporarily low prior one gets the same priority as high prior zero. And then it's able to preempt high prior one. So the Linux kernel is offering that feature because um, low prior one has to terminate its work in order to release the mutex really fast so that uh, high prior zero can resume its, um, its execution. That's what happens here low prior zero releases the mutex and then high prior zero um, resumes execution, okay? So this is what we expected. Um, because high prior zero comes in, uh, the shared resource has to be uh, given back to high prior zero. So high prior one gets preempted, low prior one terminates its execution and everything is fine. However, this is not what happens here. Uh, this is the second execution. Okay. So I have to zoom in here. By the way, uh, the backend is decoupled from the UI, which means that the analysis can be run from basically anywhere and you can use any kind of UI to, to analyze the traces. We have that backend available for everyone. So here we have the same thing. High prior zero tries to get the shared resource. Okay, so it makes that system call and then it blocks. But this time, um, high prior one doesn't get preempted by low prior one because low prior one temporarily gets the same priority as high prior zero, but that priority is not sufficient to preempt high prior one. So we are in a situation where the process high prior one, which has higher priority than low prior one, has to wait after low prior one to release the shared resource, okay? 
So if I go back to the slides here, here is the explanation, okay. In the first situation, we, we had that behavior where uh, low prior one temporarily gets the same priority as high prior zero in order to release the, the shared resource as fast as possible, okay. So low prior one preempts high prior one, terminates its execution, releases the lock and then gets preempted by high prior one. But it's not a problem because at this moment, high prior zero can resume its execution because it finally gets the lock. In the second situation, uh, high prior zero has not sufficient priority so as to preempt high prior one. And so we are in that situation where high prior one is, uh, high prior zero is blocked Okay, because it has to wait for a certain resource to be released by a process that has lower priority, which is a bit weird. So we have two distinct behavior, but we thought that we just uh, should have one. And this is, this is actually a big advantage of kernel tracing. It's that you can just run tracing, see how your application behaves, and then you can deduce things that you could not deduce uh, otherwise because uh, you know, sometimes the behavior of your application um, doesn't mean the expectations. So, uh, what can we do with that? Back to my project. Um, we, we can analyze what's uh, currently missing in open tracing. I, I hope that maybe this is clear to you that kernel tracing can have fine grained analysis and open tracing actually focuses on the tasks. Uh, that are being uh, processed in as part of the transaction. So you can actually detect uh, a few design issues that your application has. For example, if you have a, a long diagonal of spans, maybe it means that you didn't try hard enough to parallelize your application. So this might be a design issue. But in the case uh, at the bottom of the slides, we have the task, uh, task, task two that is uh, lengthy, but it could be long for several reasons, actually. It could be long because it waits for a CPU, it could be long because it waits for a shared resource, or uh, just because task two is supposed to be longer than the other ones, okay? So this is where we'd like to have uh, a finer um, grained analysis, a better insight into our system so as to deduce more things from, um, from that situation. What we'd like to have is a solution for debugging these problems that involve some kind of contention. Usually it can be mutex or network, but it can be uh, the CPU that's contended. Uh, we like also to debug other bottlenecks, for example, that comes from the interaction between your transactions and the, the actual machines on which uh, they run. And we'd also like to be able to perform a, an analysis of multiple transactions at the same time, if it makes sense, because the transactions, they're not independent. They, they, uh, they can fa fight for some uh, mutexes. They have interaction. So we have to understand that in order to understand why that, that transaction is uh, currently blocked. And we'd also like to understand how our transactions interact with the host system. So basically what we want is to have the best of both worlds, which means the the view that open tracing provides in terms of aggregating all the information and presenting that information as a single trace, uh, you know, as a logical transaction really. And we like to just add a single layer uh, that comes from kernel analysis. So as to tell us basically your task is actually very IO intensive. Maybe you should, um, you should investigate in that direction or maybe you'd like to have an analysis that tells you, well, task two is super long, but it actually executes in user space for just 10% of the time because of a certain mutex contention. Um, very fortunately for the interest of my project, we're not there yet. We have a few problems to solve first. Um, first thing is that, as you may have noticed, um, LTTNG or just kernel traces and open tracing traces are not the same, right? Um, open tracing focuses on tasks uh, represented by spans, whereas uh, LTGNG traces focus on events, um, which means that we have to recreate uh, a lot of the causality between the events um, during the analysis. 
another thing is that um, kernel tracing is actually able to understand, you know, how your threads get preempted uh, and to describe everything as being part of threads. But open tracing focuses much more on tasks and tasks can be executed not on threads, but on things like Go routines, which is another kind of, uh, of uh, abstraction. So we have to take that into account as well. We also have to find a way to synchronize the traces because uh, open tracing has not the same precision as LTTNG because it's focused on causality. Uh, there's not that need for precision. So we need to synchronize the traces so as to make joint analysis afterwards. Um, and the other thing is that we like to keep the same workflow that we have uh, when you know just monitoring a system. What we usually do is that we have some kind of uh, dashboard that is able to tell us, hey, you have um, a lot of transactions going bad, uh, or you have a high CPU usage, or you have a high latency. Uh, you can investigate that using open tracing as a second stage. Uh, and then if it's not sufficient, then we can uh, go on to the third stage, which could be kernel tracing. So we'd have to integrate all that uh, so as to keep something that is really smooth. Um, another thing is that if you have systems in production, you don't want to have a 10% or 15% uh, overhead because of kernel tracing. So usually kernel tracing is about, you know, two or 3% impact, but depending on uh, how many events you're collecting, uh, how often you're uh, activating kernel tracing can have uh, a higher impact. So we like to keep that as low as possible for it to be used uh, as a very useful tool. Okay, so that's it for my presentation. Um, I try to be short so as to leave um, uh, time for uh, discussion, uh, questions, ideas. But if you want to reach out, you can just ping me uh, on, on Gmail and I'd be happy to, uh, to discuss with you. So thank you. Thanks very much, Loic. It's really interesting. I have one question to kick things off. Uh, I um, I know we spoke about this a little bit in person, um, but yep. in terms of uh, uh, you know, one thing I think is really interesting about the kernel stuff is that you can you have a, a chance to understand contention between different transactions, uh, yep. and you you illustrated that in one of your slides. But I was curious, like, do you have um, do you have any sense, even just a ballpark thing, like whether it's feasible to get uh, some form of trace and span ID into some kind of kernel data structure, even with a patch on the kernel or something like that? Uh, it, like, do you have any sense of how much overhead is required to make that work? I know that there's a bunch of things like user space schedulers and things like that that you alluded to as challenges, but, but like pretending all that stuff can be solved, do you have a sense of how expensive it is to do this from a throughput standpoint and or from a latency standpoint? Well, um, that's a good question. So what you're saying is that you'd like to have the um, kind of uh, span ID information directly in the kernel trace points, right? Um, so if you want to do that, you need to propagate that information from the open tracing traces uh, into the kernel. And the only way you can pass information from user space to the kernel is by executing a syscall. I mean, there's, there's no other way of doing that. So basically it means that each time you want to create a span, you need to transfer the control to the kernel with a system call. Um, and usually you want to avoid that overhead because it involves a lot of context switching each time you create a span. So if we can do that just in user space, by finding a neat way of synchronizing the traces, um, it can lead to less overhead. But on the other hand, it's totally feasible. I mean, uh, there's been a paper by uh, Google recently saying that they, they did that by um, doing fake syscalls. Okay, so they, they just pick a random syscall like get PID and as part of the arguments, they just pass the, the span ID. So of course the system call fails because the arguments are not consistent but at least in your kernel trace, you can have one event corresponding to, oh, there's been a span created and it's on that physical CPU, which means that it's been triggered by that specific process, which is what you want. Um, I think that we should try to avoid that, but it can be a good idea to start first uh, uh, with because um, it, it's probably the easiest thing to do. And I know that uh, Raja has uh, students working on that. So it can be a good solution too. Yeah, 
Are there so other I, questions from people? I know you're almost out of time. I, I want to. Yeah, no, no worries. Well, I, I have a, a question uh, that we don't need to fully answer, but I was just curious, you know, uh, devil's advocate, uh, how much does getting the timing precisely to line up matter in terms, like, is there a good enough form of this if you avoid syscalls uh, where the timing is, is roughly lining up and that would still be sufficient in the majority of cases to diagnose what's going on? So you mean you'd like to, um, to have uh, a lineup that is created during the analysis, okay, between open tracing and kernel traces, that's what you mean? Yes, like okay. if, in your, if in your open tracing, say your scope manager, that's the part of open tracing that knows when, when contexts are being switched around. Yes. If it, you know, recording something out in user land at some level of granularity that's presumably, you know, uh, lower than what the kernel is doing, you can still kind of staple them back together out of band, but it wouldn't be as precise. But is that good enough for most use cases? I don't think it is because um, if you, if I'm taking you to that, um, to trace compass, to, to give you a sense of how many things can happen in just a few nanoseconds into the kernel, um, for example, this system call, it takes roughly 10 microseconds. And you can have shorter than that. So it means that basically in just a few microseconds, you can have several sketch switches. So if your uh, open tracing trace tells you uh, that span has been created at that timestamp, which is precisely the millisecond, um, and then you have the kernel trace, you're not going to be able to say precisely that span was created while that process was running on CPU. Because you could have a sketch switch just right after, right before that just basically uh, uh, make your, makes your analysis not valid. So I think we should have some kind of explicit synchronization between the traces. So as Ben said, we could do that through the kernel, but it can also be done instrumenting uh, open tracing traces using other kind of traces like LTTNG. So this is something that I did just, just uh, for trying. I instrumented uh, Jaeger so as to have information in LTTNG traces about when uh, a span is created and when a span is, um, is uh, stopped, actually. Awesome, is that, that code out there and available? Yeah, sure, so you can uh, just go to my, just going to my last slide, you can just go to my GitHub um, account and it's one of the latest repos. I think it's called a Jaeger uh, something instru for instrumentation. Awesome. But, but I, I can I can probably if you send me an email I can tell you how to uh, how to uh, run it because I just did it during the KubeCon and obviously I did not uh, try hard enough uh, having a proper readme to to tell you how to use it. Great, that's that's really great. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Uh, any other final questions uh, before Loic has to get off the call? All right, sounds good. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. Well, thank you very much for your time too. And if anyone uh, has a question after that, you can just reach me uh, through email and I'd be happy to, to help you. Awesome. Okay, Cheers. have a nice one, bye. Great. Well, that was awesome. Um, I don't know if people want to, to have any continued discussion about that. Uh, we can, uh, I would recommend people go try to play with that uh, repo as sort of the next step. Uh, I'd love to hear a report back on, on you know, how that could get cleaned up because that sounds really cool. Yeah, I, when, I didn't want to, I know Lowe had a hard stop, so I didn't want to just add a comment and waste his time with a comment. But one thing that we talked about in person in um, Copenhagen was that a lot of the kernel tracing uh, it ends up I think that you can think of it as a way to decorate traces with a lot of extra detail, which is fine. And I think that's all well and good, but a lot of the most powerful applications of it have to do with, uh, you know, a credible way to do uh, the, an, an analysis of how different transactions interact with each other because the kernel is the best place to see those sorts of 
contention situations like that that's some of what his examples focused on um so i think that uh in my mind part of the um the power of that stuff and this is not an open tracing comment just a general tracing comment is yeah. is about uh using the kernel as a way to understand interactions between transactions without having to do any kind of special instrumentation in, in the source code. And I mean, if you could find a way to, to make that cheap so that you could see that these two different transactions depend on the same file descriptor or mutex or whatever, that's really profound. I mean, an incredibly powerful thing. And I have no idea about the actual fact overhead of doing that, but if that's the only thing you did and you didn't record anything else, I think that alone would be a really powerful thing. Yeah. By one other comment is I can't help but think this is an issue that really requires probably possibly maybe doesn't require but it seems like a language level thing right like if you're operating in a language that doesn't uh, give doesn't think about this and then you're doing on top of that some kind of user level context switching it's going to be really difficult on top of that whole sandwich to come back in and efficiently staple all this stuff together. Um, Still possible though, with the Go runtime, you can you can know when the Go routines get uh, switched. Um, but yeah, more trickier than when with just like plain thread language. Yeah, and yeah. and Go is like a good one. Uh, the execution tracer coming in Go uh, one eleven looks very interesting, and I wonder how much that could assist with this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I just took a look at his uh, repo, and I think he did it mostly in C with Go bindings back to C, uh, mostly because that's what his tracing uh, library is in. But yeah. Yeah. I have to say, I appreciated that he was talking about open tracing, but I don't really think of this as an open tracing project. I mean, to do this properly right now, you kind of need to hard code some understanding of in memory representations of things. Like, you know, even if we uh, decide to add a bunch of accessors to span context or something like that, like, you're going to have to get pretty down and dirty to make this stuff work, you know? So yeah. that's, I mean, that's why his repo is called Jaeger, et cetera, which I think is totally fine. But, mm -hmm. but this is, the, I mean, I don't know what other people think, but I don't really see this as being an open tracing project. I think this is a tracing project. Um, I, I don't think of it as something that benefits from like a shared instrumentation library as much as, as you know, uh, like I think you need to understand in memory representations and things like that. Yeah, it seems like making it work with open tracing is, the easy part, provided you can make it work, period. Exactly. Anyway, Loic is a really awesome guy. He's very approachable and fun to talk to. We had a bunch of conversations offhand in Copenhagen, so I'd encourage people to reach out to him if they're curious about that stuff. He's a very collaborative fellow. Awesome. All right, well, we've got maybe uh, 20 minutes left on the call. Uh, happy to continue this discussion. Uh, there were a couple other agenda items uh, that were thrown on uh, that we could work through uh, pretty quickly. Uh, two are just report backs. Um, and then maybe we can go back to, to talking about this or get off the call. Um, first one is just uh, someone asked for a report back from the W3C trace context working group meeting in Germany. Uh, I think the, the primary report back there is like uh, trace context is coming along. Uh, there's really two parts of it that are in flight. The part that is hopefully getting to a sort of V1, like a testable V1, not a final V1, is the, the sort of uh, uh, propagation headers, specifically a uh, trace parent and trace state, which is everything you would need to glue multiple different tracing systems together uh, and be able to correlate them so that you could propagate a trace from one tracing system into another, and then on the back end, hopefully be able to export data from one of those systems into the other, so you can get a complete trace. Uh, there wasn't any discussion of the sort of baggage uh, header, which is called correlation context. But there was a bit of a nascent discussion around what I'm calling trace data, which is, okay, fine, let's say we go ahead and do this work and now we're able to staple these traces together uh, in terms of the correct span IDs and trace IDs and things like that. 
But if we're going to do all that work, presumably you're now going to have to export data from one of these systems into another one. And when you do that, you're back to a sort of end-to-end -end problem of all these different tracing systems and different data export formats. Uh, so that's an issue that it would be nice to massage over and go from end-to-end -to, -end to one to one. And maybe even more importantly is if you kind of define some kind of trace data format, could we use that as a vehicle for moving um, forwards with a more semantic definition of the content of that data. So basically kind of the work on standardizing tags and open tracing, could we do that work in a slightly broader fashion? So regardless if you're using open tracing or not, can we just call, you know, can an HTTP call be an HTTP call? And is it possible for us to, to kind of standardize on that? Uh, so there was definitely interest in doing that because it seems like the other half of the problem. Uh, there's the main takeaway there was to sort of do a review of existing trace data formats uh, and do a compare and contrast of what's currently out there to see if there's some easy subset that emerges from that and use that as maybe a basis for going forwards. So that's sort of the next step on that project. In general, there was some discussion uh, uh, I had this feeling, I wasn't there quite for the end, I understand other people had this feeling, that we should really be meeting more frequently in more kind of focused working group sessions. Uh, this was called the Trace Context Working Group, but really it was a more kind of general distributed tracing uh, meeting. And would it be better if we just had more frequent meetings that were focused on solving specific problems in trace context so that we could get that over the finish line. So hopefully that will occur. And I do wonder something similar about open tracing as well when we have you know, some kind of thorny design issue, can we have just more frequent meetings over Zoom or otherwise to kind of drive through those problems? Seeing as GitHub issues for all these standardization efforts seem to just fall down when you actually have some kind of discussion-based problem you're trying to work through. It just doesn't seem like a great medium for coming to any kind of consensus. So when we go away from these meetings and then go back to GitHub, it just seems like velocity drops. And I feel like we've seen that in open tracing as well. So that was my general takeaway, meet more frequently. Any questions about the trace context stuff? Not everyone may be familiar with that. So there was a, a, um, a meeting at uh, KubeCon for the cloud events working group. Uh, it's related to the serverless, serverless uh, working group at the CNCF. And they're also thinking about implementing some sort of context. And it's very, very similar to the trace context. right? And I think they might also join the W3C or at least ask them to take a look at this back and see if there is something there they need and which is out there. So, okay. Um, perhaps um, if they don't talk to you guys at that um, spec, then it would probably be a good idea to um, talk to them. I mean, I, I talked to Reddy Hat uh, guys that are participating on that working group, asking them to you know try to unify the contracts into one spec. Um, Good to hear. Would be, yeah, it would be nice if you guys, if you know somebody working on that group, uh, you guys also you know, to reinforce this idea. Do you have a, a, a link for that? I'm gonna post a link to this W3C trace context group. Yeah, so it's at uh, cloudevents.io. Uh, is there, what, so they, they, yeah, I just placed there. And uh, on their meeting notes, uh, there are a couple action items uh, about through the tracing, actually. I just uh, saw that on their um, May 10th meeting that they do have an, an action item for this with the tracing. So add a proposal for integrating with this with the tracing for tracing not annotations. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this does look like it has quite a bit of overlap just from glancing at their, their web page. Yeah. Cool. I look forward to the emerging five standards on this subject. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So perhaps dropping the name tracing would be more appropriate right now, but uh, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> center for another center. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can find time, not just to meet as individual groups, but some, some amount of time in front or around some of these conferences to have intergroup meetings, just because to a certain degree, I think there's just maybe a lack of awareness sometimes about what the other groups are up to. Great. Uh, well, that I feel like dovetails nicely into the next action item, which was a report back from KubeCon. So that was one report back from KubeCon in Denmark. Um, my report back is Copenhagen is beautiful. Uh, we also gave a couple of uh, open tracing uh, sort of Q&A talks. I know, uh, JP, you, you gave a talk as well uh, that seemed to go over well. And all of that is online now, I think. The videos have been posted. Uh, do you have a link you want to post, uh, JP, to your talk? If you've got it handy. Put it in the uh, yeah, I have it. Uh, but it's mostly eager, so not open tracing really. Oh, okay. I try, yeah. So I try to um, um, make you know make as less open tracing as possible because you guys have also uh, the same talks, the same project intro and um, deep dive. So I just refer to the talks. Mm -hmm. Great, and I'll, I'll uh, try to find links to the, the other talks we gave. Um, one of them was just a sort of Q&A session that I think was helpful. Um, and that's another thing that I think is, is useful to almost, I don't know if we could schedule Zooms, but, but maybe more like office hours or something. People have questions and they often, um, it's almost, they find it easier to ask them, you know, using their voices human to human and get an answer that way. So providing more space for people to be able to ask questions and have like Q and A sessions might, might be helpful to the project. In Node.js, we did this sort of office hours thing at a certain inflection point where there was a big influx of new users. Uh, and that was kind of helpful. Just letting people know when they could log into Gitter and a, a, a Zoom meeting and, and people, core members of the project would just be available to answer questions. Might, might be a good action item for us to start soon. So let me, let me know if you're interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just in terms of the conference in general, I think I was supposed to give one talk, but I ended up sort of giving two and a half because uh, Donald Trump wouldn't let Bianca leave the country. So I had to fill in for some of her stuff, but uh, but it was good. I felt like there was um, a really nice reception. I tried to give a talk that really wasn't really even about open tracing. It was just a similar talk to the type of things that like Eric has posted about just trying to you know this uh, to de to detangle the open trace the open source tracing ecosystem in general. And that was really well received. And and I think people um, uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, I think we should continue to do that uh, and clarify the positioning of the various projects in the space. And then the both the intro and kind of expert sessions on open tracing were well attended and there's a lot of interest in everything. In terms of just being out in the show floor, uh, it, it was pretty obvious that like everyone, um, you know, that's like KubeCon is pretty biased towards like understanding CNCF stuff. So it's not like this is a random sample of the population just walking around Copenhagen, but it was also pretty obvious that they all understood what open tracing was at a basic at a basic level and and um, and a lot of them were actually applying it within their organizations and both like, you know, companies like Uber and so on and so forth, but also um, people from MasterCard and giant German banks and stuff like that. So it was, um, it was interesting to see that kind of proliferation. Yeah. Great. Any other KubeCon related business? Not really, although I, I did think that um, for the next one of these uh, that, you know, we have people talking at, um, uh, I don't know how to accomplish this. You know, we had these salons before and then they gave us like these half an hour slots. Like I really would have preferred to have um, had the thing that you ran. It was like basically a Q&A with a, 
a quick 15 minute presentation ahead of time. Like I, I would have preferred to have done like a really long Q and A, you know, like it would have been great to have the one hour Q and A uh, or something like that. I wonder if we can make that happen. But I, I felt like that Q and A session was maybe more valuable than any of the presentations because the questions that were coming from the audience were, you know, very good and, 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 um, uh, and it yeah. just felt it felt more interesting to me. So I, I'd like to try and get the CNCF people to give us that sort of um, situation. I don't really care what they call it, but I think that would be valuable. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in unconferences, you know, where the people who show up for it get to define what gets talked about is really immensely powerful for people in terms of getting their questions answered. But yeah, that's that's for us to to bother the the CNCF about. The, we also sometimes try to run workshops there, and, and I, I I wonder if like we should focus more on these like Q and A sessions because the workshops really do seem to conflict with the kind of you know thing these conferences tend to want to provide space for and time for. Not to mention conference Wi Fi and you know tutorials are bad combo. <laughs> Anyways, uh, one final item on the agenda that I threw up is Docuthon. So we've got a new website coming for open tracing. It looks like it's almost in the state where we can uh, get uh, content put into it. I tried standing it up uh, this week. It looks almost there. Uh, Luke uh, from the CNCF has been working on it for us, the same person who uh, redid the Jaeger site. So that's very exciting. I'll send an announcement out once that's in a state where people can start uh, pushing documentation by making PRs against a branch on the Open Tracing IO uh, GitHub repo. So that's that's almost there. That'll hopefully be there uh, next week. Um, so that's a thing that's coming. And to then help kind of push everything out the door, we'd like to do a, a docuthon. So a poll is gonna go out today around potential uh, times for having this. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, but we're thinking in the month of June, we'll do this. And the idea behind a docuthon is we, you know, want to get enough rough stuff out there that there's sort of a trellis that, you know, we can grow the rest of the documentation on and then kind of have a big push to get everyone around at the same time, all of the experts, all the people who work on the different languages combined with uh, people who know how to write docs and edit and clean them up and see if we can just do a sort of big day long push to clean things up and, and get, get everything out the door. And so uh, that'll be happening in June. Uh, people who want to get involved in that uh, or organizing it, uh, please let me know. Uh, contact me on Gitter or send me an email, and I hope to see you all there. And that is everything that we have on our agenda. So uh, I'd like to open the floor to any questions, comments, bike sheds, people like to go over. We've got a couple minutes left. All right, well, I'm gonna paint this bike shed black and say the meeting is over. Great seeing you all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.